When you're in a job, particularly when you're new in a job and you've arrived in an important position, ask yourself not what's the long list of things I could do, but rather what are the two or three things in this business, in this job, that are going to make a difference. You can't be incompetent or malfeasant on the other things, but you'll never get ahead doing pretty well at everything. You'll only get ahead doing really, really well at a few very important things. I don't know any profession where that fails to be true. So when I took this job, I had a little list, and it had two parts to it. The things I needed to focus on substantively and the people I needed to focus on substantively. Who needed to feel like my arrival was not a kidney stone? Who needed to feel like this was good for them in order for my experiment to be a success? And I had to work those people, like the CFO and the leaders of operations and the head of the Nevada business and the senior regulator and a few others, as hard as I worked those substantive issues. And if I could work that small set of things, I had a reasonable likelihood that I would succeed. And every day I would ask myself, have I advanced that set of issues? And I would encourage you to do a similar sort of thing. A very famous colleague of mine at Harvard made a living writing stories called Teaching how Smart People How to Learn. And his argument was the smarter and more accomplished we are, the poorer our qualities of learning. We become so accustomed to being right that we can't be challenged to consider that we're not. And as a leader, I believe this to be the central challenge. When can you anticipate instances when your approach will fail you? When can you anticipate circumstances when the people working around you aren't making the right decisions? How do you determine who is the bad mother? If you find me 100 mothers, there are 10 that aren't very good. Surely there are some bad mothers. There have to be some below average. The same thing applies. So having some degree of self-reflection about what type of decision maker you're going to be and recognizing the weaknesses of each is important. Many of you will work in organizations where decisions are made largely by hunch and experience. When you notice people saying things like, I saw this once before and it went this way, you're in a business where people make decisions largely on experience. If on the other hand, someone says, let's run an experiment, let's look at this group of people exposed to one provocation and these in the control group and let's look to see what happens, you're in a very different place. Each of them has their own vulnerabilities. The critical thing is that you know which is which. If you want to be a leader with a high degree of credibility over a long period of time, you got to tell the truth almost all the time in a way that particularly the people in your own organization come to believe. So when there's bad news, you're the first person to tell them. And when there's good news, let somebody else tell them. When something went wrong, it's always your fault. When something went right, it's never you who did it. That's the combination you're looking for. People will always give you enough credit. You just don't have to be the one seeking it. The average tenure of a Fortune 500 CEO is four years. So I've been in this job 11 years, and I don't own a controlling interest in the company. One of the ways I've been able to do this is not because I get everything right. It's because when something bad happens, my directors hear it from me first. And I'm always accountable every time. My directors, David Bonderman, Leon Black, Mark Rowan, when something goes wrong, the first person they hear from is me. And they'll hear from me before they hear from anyone else. And it's never anyone's fault but mine. That's it. And that's not to be a hero, but that's to set the right tone in the business for what we're doing. 